Is it Brexit which is impacting on the economy, or is it economic conditions which have created Brexit? What is the political economy of the Brexit farago? What's George Kerouin from Scotland and Professor Richard Murphy from England debate the economic conditions which have created Brexit? And what is to be done for the future? Join us on The Alex Salmon Show, on air and online. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, where we continue our series on the economic conditions against which the Brexit political drama is being played out. Last week, Alex interviewed one of the world's leading Keynesian economists, Professor David Blanchflower, on his prediction of another international recession. I don't think you could have picked a worse time to pick out and do Brexit. It's unclear exactly what the short and, in the end, long-term consequences of Brexit are and separate them from the fact that there's a global trade war going on. It's the end of a 10-year-long recovery. And all of those things are happening together. Brexit itself for the global economy, says the IMF, is a downside risk uh, entirely to the world. In this week's show, we ask key commentators north and south of the border about the political economy of Brexit. From Scotland, economist and former MP George Kerevan spells out an alternative economic agenda to the prevailing wisdom across the liberal democracies. What we need to do is to, is to fundamentally change the economy. Scotland is creating uh, a state investment bank and rather than rely on the ups and downs of, of, of the of free market finance, we are going to use that state investment bank to invest against the cycle. So if there is a downturn, then through that bank, we will be able to pump investment cash into the economy. My prescription, don't rely on, 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 the, on, on the ups and downs of, of the free market. Invest long term. And to do that, you need a state investment bank. From England, leading taxation expert Professor Richard Murphy details some of the unintended fiscal consequences of Brexit. Cash flow is actually the biggest potential implication of Brexit that I can see. No one, including the government in its Yellowhammer documents, has talked about who is going to pay the cost of lorries sitting for two and a half days waiting to get through Dover. The point is that's going to impose substantial cost. If it's the truck company that's paying, they can't afford it. If it's the customer that's paying, the price is going up. But it means that not just there aren't trucks in operation, Trucks are being paid to do nothing. Now, that could drive literally every haulage company who goes across the channel out of business in weeks because they won't be able to afford it. New Prime Minister Boris Johnson's first six weeks in power have been nothing if not eventful. His controversial decision to prorogue Parliament has set off a chain reaction which has turned a bare majority of just one into what is in effect a minority of 40. The United Kingdom is now heading for its third general election in the last four years, and Boris Johnson runs the risk of being the shortest term Prime Minister in British history. However, in addition to understanding the political twists and turns of Westminster, Brexit should also be seen as a reaction to underlying economic conditions. In today's show, we ask two of the country's leading political economists on the extent to which the economics are dictating the politics of a Brexit. Alex speaks first to former Member of Parliament George Kerevan, who advocates a new economic agenda to replace the economics of austerity, which has prevailed since the Great Recession of more than a decade ago. George Kerevan, uh, looking at the trends in the international economy at the present moment, how concerned are you that we're heading into a, a fury as far as a recession is concerned? Well, Alex, I mean, economists are, are meant to be pessimists, but if you look at the hard numbers at the moment, uh, it's difficult not to see a perfect storm gathering, particularly over the UK economy. Mm -hmm. Business manufacturing down, uh, worse than seven years. Um, we've got a, we've actually, the, th the second quarter, um, GDP has actually stalled. Uh, it's down. Uh, we're well into the, the third quarter. I suspect we may already be in recession in the UK. Uh, normally, your economy, um, if it does have a dip, it's one particular bit of the economy that gets impacted. 
Um, but actually, all the major drivers of the UK economy are in serious trouble, which suggests something international is happening. Construction, normally the biggest you know, engine of the economy, um, uh, lowest orders in, since the, the, the banking crisis of 2008. Um, consumer spending, now that's the biggie. We depend on consumer spending. Retail sales down over the year. Um, and not just um, footfall in high street shops. Um, the, the shift towards um, internet spending, that's stalled. Um, house prices have stalled. I mean, we are in, we're in, we're in, we're in trouble. But we used to talk uh, about a jobless recovery. When recovery had started in the economy, but the jobs market wasn't moving. Now we seem to be in a, a job full recession where the economy looks like it's teetering on the brink of recession, but the jobs market still stays strong. Actually, we're, we're, we're kind of at the top of the hill and going down the other side. The latest uh, figures from ONS, which is the, the agency here in the UK that does all, all the independent stats, unemployment has, in the last quarter started to rise. Not a lot, but unemployment started to go up. And, but if you delve down into the figures, you'll see that full-time employment has started to drop. It's the part-time employment, it's the marginal employment, the gig economy. That it's, it's massaging the figures and making them look good. I think there's something boiling up which is a bit more problematic. It's certainly, it's partly Brexit uncertainty. It's also very much the international economy. Trump's trade wars haven't helped. The, the attempt by the Chinese uh, regime to slow its economy is feeding through. That means the Germans can't sell their, their cars. The German economy has gone into recession. Um, so Britain, you know, Britain, Britain can't remain aloof, particularly if we have a hard Brexit. Now, you mentioned that uh, the trade war between America and China, the two greatest economies in the world uh, is clearly causing some consternation and probably having a direct economic effect. Uh, but couldn't President Trump, uh, those in his favour, say, well, he's the man battling with the Fed to try and keep interest rates down. He's the one who recognises the, the dangers of too tight money as we're heading into recession. So aren't there some arguments in President Trump's favour? Well, I think, obviously, if we do head into a recession, um, cutting interest rates will be uh, helpful. But the trouble is we've, we've been doing that for a decade. The margin, most economists think the margin for helping the global economy by cutting interest rates is pretty narrow. What we need is a boost to investment. Now, in the States, what Trump has done, of course, Trump slashed taxes uh, and created a, an artificial boomlet. And that's kind of run out of steam now. Um, so e e even in America, cutting interest rates is not going to do that much for the economy. Uh, in the UK, similar thing. I mean, if, if you were to ask me what's the big problem in the UK, it's lack of business investment, not just because firms are worried about Brexit. Productivity, which is the real driver of economic growth and wealth, productivity has fallen for the last four quarters. We're actually getting less good at doing things in the UK. And this is exactly the point when Boris Johnson wants to take us into the big wide world. We need to fix our our domestic economy, and that means real investment in real plant and machinery. Now, thinking about Brexit and the impact on these factors, uh, most analysis would suggest that a, a hard Brexit, even a soft hard Brexit, would have a substantial economic impact. But there's also the fact that if people believe the economy is heading to recession, you wouldn't want an electoral test when the effects of that recession are starting to be come home to roost in terms of rising job numbers. Would that be an argument if you believe that for getting to the polls now before recession is upon us? Well, I think, I mean, if that isn't a calculation in, in, in the White House and in number 10, um, then they're being a bit daft. I mean, I certainly think um, because uh, Trump knows he's got a, a presidential election next year, that's why he's pushing uh, the American Central, Central Bank, the Fed, to lower interest rates. I mean, I mean, Trump is desperate to keep uh, his artificial boomlet going in the States because in, if you look to, to 2021, um, it's very likely the U U US economy really will run out of steam and that will really take the whole world economy down. Here in the UK, yes, uh, Boris needs to get an election over uh, before we hit a really rough patch. So, I mean, if, if, if it turns out, as I'm predicting, uh, that we, we go into a technical recession in the UK uh, at the end of September, um, Boris could find himself, Conservatives could find himself fighting a general election uh, at a time when the economy is not doing well at all. How about the larger effects? I mean, some people would argue that the painfully slow recovery from the great financial crash of 
it has actually itself been a major driver of the, the changes in the politics of the liberal democracies, uh, Trump in America, Brexit in the United Kingdom, the, the populist right in many of the mm. European democracies. H how seriously do you rate that as the, the causal factor of the sort of politics we see played out now? Oh, I think it has a major impact. It's, it's a long-term process. It actually goes back before uh, 2008 and the global banking crisis. It started in America. Um, the, the reason why wages went up and the share of wages in, in, in national income went up through the 50s, 60s, 70s was, and it, you know, I hate to say this, but it's actually because of all those strong trade unions that people complained about, um, but they could force wage increases higher than inflation. Now, once uh, after the Reagan-Thatcher era, once the big trade unions were broken, and once the, the, the industrial structure changed away from big factories, big mass production, big workforces who could exert an influence, to small firms, uh, electronics, et cetera, et cetera. Once you did all that, then it became practically impossible um, for working people to exert pressure on wages. Now, unless some, somewhere from the progressive left, um, somebody takes a hand and intervenes to raise uh, uh, incomes, um, then people begin to panic and they begin to look for extreme solutions. And then the right wing comes along. The right wing starts, well, starts to blame immigrants, but it's not immigrants at all. It's, it's something within the fundamental motor of how the wage economy works. And so you get, um, you get the populist parties rising across Europe. I mean, I live happily in a place, fortunately, in a place called Scotland where, where, where those right wing forces have not emerged because we've had sensible social democratic government um, which has tried to maintain living standards and use the power of the state to try and offset uh, the, the, the pressure uh, to push wages down. But unless we alter the fundamental way the economy works and the way wages are distributed out of national income, then that problem is not going to go away and we can see that a base is being created for the right. Now, George Cavan, you're a, a left of centre political economist, you're a, uh, a former member of parliament. What would be your prescription for the left of centre to combat these trends? What would be your manifesto for a, a, a different perspective <laughs> on the economy? Well, we need, it, it, it's not just like sort of Brexit, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's uh, uh, an irritant, that's it. But, but what we need to do is to, is to fundamentally change the economy. Again, Scotland is experimenting. I'm, I'm very proud of this because I was involved in some of the discussions. Scotland is creating uh, a state investment bank. And rather than rely on the ups and downs of, of, of the of free market finance, we are going to use that state investment bank to invest against the cycle. This investment bank should be set up next year. So if there is a downturn, then through that bank, we will be able to pump investment cash into the economy. It, down in, in England, I know the Labour Party, I'd give them their due, are talking about creating a, 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 a state investment bank there. State investment banks are not abnormal. Germany has had, has had one since, uh, since, the, since the 1950s, and that's one of the reasons the German economy is so strong. You don't rely on my prescription. Don't rely on, 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 the, on, on the ups and downs of, of the free market. Invest long term. And to do that, you need a state investment bank. George Caravan from Edinburgh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Welcome back. Much of the debate on Brexit has concerned the dislocation to the economy threatened by a no-deal exit from the European Union. Today, Alex interviews Professor Richard Murphy, who points to other unintended consequences of a hard Brexit. Professor Richard Murphy, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, Brexit obviously is a, a huge deal in the UK, has been for the last uh, uh, three years. But around the world, how big does Brexit seem in terms of its economic effects? Well, look, I have done quite a lot of travel with my job and right across Europe, many capitals. And actually, it is a big deal. You can't go in a taxi in Europe without the taxi driver realising that you're from the UK and talking Brexit. It is a big deal. Now, does that mean it matters? Yes, but not economically to most countries in the way it does to us. What it does do is create massive uncertainty in the world economy and in the world's politics. Europe suddenly doesn't know what it is anymore. But from a, a European, by which I mean European Commission, major states in Europe, the uncertainty of sacrificing the integrity of the single market must have appeared greater to them. Otherwise, they would have uh, offered Mrs May more to enable her to get 
her deal over the line in the House of Commons. Look, the single market matters to the European Union. It's one of its own red lines, backstops, whatever you wish to call it. They are not going to negotiate away the fact that the entire intention of the European community as it was, the European Union as it now is, was about creating a common market, as those of us of our age will remember calling it once upon a time. It is about breaking down the barriers to trade. Now, those are about common standards of production, common taxation, removing the borders. And they're not going to get rid of that because that is the essence of the European Union. The European ideal is greater than keeping the UK in. They will, therefore, take the hit. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And that's why they are not going to compromise at any point with the single market and say, look, you can be in, but half-heartedly. That's just not an option for them. And thinking about the, the general world economic environment, I mean, could it have been a worse time uh, in recent uh, years to engage in the, the economics of Brexit, hard or soft? The world economic environment is looking pretty rough like, right now. I, the US and China are at war, trade war. But frankly, that's pretty close to war. They are absolutely at loggerheads, and that is having a serious impact upon both countries. Germany is heading for recession, and even if the USA settles with China at some point, it will turn next on Germany because it hates Germany almost as much as China because Germany runs a persistent surplus. I mean, the president of the United States. Well, the president <laughs> of the United States. This is ancestral. Absolutely clear. This is ancestral home. Yeah, and yet he's absolutely opposed to Germany. We have got these ideological wars going on over economics which are spilling over into world politics. And in all of that, we have Brexit. Now, some of the logics are not dissimilar. They're protectionist. They're about identity. You know, America first sounds awfully like we must be taking back control in very many ways. So there are commonalities between the UK and the USA in this sense. I mean, I don't call that a special relationship in any form either, but there are commonalities. And they are creating this massive uncertainty. We're also over due in plain, straightforward, simple terms for a global recession. On average, they happen every seven years. Look, we had the most massive one in 2008, 9, 10, and we're now in 2019. And we've been bumping along the bottom. We've not been doing any better than that since 2010 or 11. So frankly, the pure mathematics of logic say at some point we're going to have a downturn. We have been able to hold things steady. We will have a recession anyway, but we're going to have it and it's going to be more powerful because we have got trade wars going on all over the world and we're contributing to that through Brexit. Now, most of the focus on potential effects of a Brexit, uh, hard or soft, have focused on things like interruption to trade, massive jams of, of, of lorries, uncertainty affecting business investment, the financial sector relocation, issues like that. But, but your studies in, in accountancy and taxation have identified some other issues which may well be significant in terms of the financial effects of Brexit. There's a lot of detail, and I'm not going to discuss the technicalities, but which we need to take into account. We're, for example, going to see some changes in some very basic taxes, which most people ignore most of the time because you know, they pay them, but they don't even notice it. VAT, for example. VAT is a European tax. It is designed to operate at a European level. And so long as we're in the European Union, goods flow through Dover and through our airports and everywhere else without interruption by VAT. In effect, there is no VAT paid at the ports. If we're outside... That's why VAT has to be coordinated across the European market. Indeed. That's, and it, it took a long time to achieve that. For the first 20 years that we were in the European Union, we did not have that coordination. I'm old enough to remember when we had to do a, had to do a lot of form-filling to make VAT work across borders. And from the 90s onwards, that disappeared. And the benefit to business was enormous at two levels. One, less administration, but two less cash flow risk because you used to have to pay to bring your goods into the UK. You had to pay the VAT at the moment they arrived. Now remember, we are a heavy importing nation. Now that suddenly will be locking up large amounts of business cash in paying the VAT when the goods arrive to reclaim from customs and excise later on. Cash flow is actually the biggest potential implication of Brexit that I can see. No one, including the government in its yellow hammer documents, has talked about 
who is going to pay the cost of lorries sitting for two and a half days waiting to get through Dover? Truck companies run on the tiniest of margins using leased vehicles. They rent those vehicles. They don't own them. Someone's got to pay that rent when they're sitting for two and a half days waiting to get through Dover when previously they took 10 minutes. The point is that's going to impose substantial cost. If it's the truck company that's paying, they can't afford it. If it's the customer that's paying, the price is going up. But it means that not just there aren't trucks in operation, trucks are being paid to do nothing. Now that could drive literally every haulage company who goes across the channel out of business in weeks because they won't be able to afford it. So thinking about a document like Yellowhammer, disavowed by the, the government, of course, as old hat, but the dates on the document suggest is something different. But nonetheless, did, did it focus on these technical issues about, about VAT and cash flow, or, or was it more fo focused on the, the front line stuff, like you know, how many lorries can you fit in a car park, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Yellowhammer was focused very much on short-term logistics. How can we get food through ports? How can we get medicines in? What are the disruptions? What is actually going to cause the stress to ministers because it's the first thing to hit the headlines? VAT won't be the first thing that hits headlines, nor will, in the slightly longer term, the fact that we will lose control of VAT on imports and exports, where there has been massive fraud through the postal system in the past. Uh, it took us years to close down abuse through the Channel Islands, which cost a fortune. We will lose control of the distance selling operations through things like Amazon and eBay, where we've only just managed to eliminate VAT fraud, which has cost billions to the UK. These are the long-term implications of losing the coordination with Europe. The cost to us of increased tax abuse is going to be phenomenal. Was that in Yellowhammer? No. Is it going to be a real cost which is going to harm public services in the UK? Yes. Do we have any answers to those questions? No. Do we have the people at HM Revenue and Customs who know how to deal with this? No. Why? Because we've been cutting the number of staff at HM Revenue and Customs and they're going through a chaotic reorganisation already. Do they have the software to deal with this issue? No. Do they actually therefore have the capacity in any way to handle the scale of disruption they're likely to face? No. Are we going to have a tax system in meltdown as a consequence? Yes. Was that in Yellowhammer? No. Are governments therefore taking the risk seriously? I don't think so. And that's before they even do anything as absurd as trying to create Singapore on Thames, the tax haven that they'd love to create in London, which is going to be massively disruptive for our relationships with other countries around the world. So would that explain, thinking about the, the detail of this, you know, why on the one hand Michael Gove talks about short-term disruption, and on the other hand, uh, Philip Hammond <laughs> talks about medium-term catastrophe from a, a hard no-deal Brexit. There's a short-term disruption that we will face from Brexit. Nobody disputes it. My worry is that it will last a lot longer. Some businesses will simply fail as a result of that short-term disruption. They won't be there to recover to face the longer term. If we lose truck companies, if we lose people who are importing and exporting, if we lose those jobs, then actually the disruption goes on and on and on. Because literally the infrastructure, our transport systems for example, may well not be there to carry on doing import and export into 2020. The long term consequences of this, let alone the difficulties in our tax authority, are enormous. And let's say in a parallel universe that the forces in the Conservative Party two or three years ago who were saying, Let's have a look at the EFTA-style European economic area type Brexit. Would that have avoided all of these disruptive tendencies? Look, if we had been willing to look at a single market, a Norway-style or a Swiss-style deal with Europe, a lot of these economic disruptions would have disappeared. If we'd had a political Brexit, in other words, separating control of migration, which was one of the major motivations, although often denied, if we'd actually been trying to take back control at a political level through the court system or whatever, then maybe we would have actually still achieved a Brexit, but stayed in the economic cooperation area around the single market and so on, and then we would have been okay. Then we would have avoided most of the disruption. As it is, we've gone for maximum disruption to achieve the small political gains that will be won. And finally then, uh, do you think in the, the quiet of night among even the keenest Brexiteer there might be a, a little voice saying, mm, perhaps we should look more closely at the European economic area style of Brexit? 
What I find really strange about the Brexiteers is most of them claim to be pro-business. Do you know, I can, cannot think of a policy which is more anti-business that anybody could have put forward than Brexit. It's undermining the certainty they need. It's undermining the trading relationships that they have to have. It's undermining their contracts. It's creating extra administration, which they claim to hate. And all of that, for what? They must have doubts. Or else they've just abandoned their old principles, which were we're pro-business, because Brexit is not pro-business. It's absolutely, fundamentally anti-business. And that leaves us in this very strange place that we have the traditional parties of business apparently undermining it. What more do we want as an indication that we live in unusual times? Well, perhaps in the debates to come, uh, Mr Corbyn should be speaking about an anti-banker's Brexit being proposed <laughs> as opposed to a banker's <laughs> Brexit. Well, bankers are in an odd position here. I mean, if we look at what Corbyn is doing, he's right to say there's a banking Brexit. But remember, banks are not the same as business. Mm. This is a good Brexit for the people who want to extract money from other people. It's a bad Brexit for the people who want to make money by working. And they're fundamentally different parts of the economy. But surely it's a hedge fund Brexit, not a banker's Brexit. Well, <laughs> hedge funds and bankers probably coordinate in a very large degree these days. I'm afraid the dividing line between those two is there. But when I was in practice as a chartered accountant, and I was, a lot of my clients had to decide who they disliked most, their tax authority or their bank manager. And sometimes it was a close-run thing. Professor Richard Murphy, these were the halcyon days. And even in these days, of course, uh, this was one essential, whether it was the, the tax authorities or the bank manager, and that was to, to get the whiskey in the quake, Scots Gaelic for a loving cup, uh, and pass it around whoever bank manager or tax authorities you dislike <laughs> the least. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Great pleasure. Thanks a lot. The Brexit debate in the House of Commons has dominated every other issue. Even the economy, which usually dictates everything, has taken a backseat to the in-out European drama. Last week, for example, the Chancellor's autumn spending statement, which would normally be a parliamentary highlight, was sandwiched almost as an afterthought between Prime Minister's questions and the bill by which the Rebel Alliance of MPs sought to exclude the possibility of a no-deal Brexit. However, in the first two programmes of the series, we have explained first how world economic conditions, and then today, how the political economy underlying the Brexit debate in the United Kingdom, have in reality dictated the existence and the timing of the European withdrawal process. It remains to be seen whether it will also be the economy which dictates the eventual outcome. In next week's show, we shall turn back to the international environment and ask the world's top economists about the effect of economic conditions on the possibility of political change. Professor Carlos Bosch of Princeton University answers the question on whether governments around the world have the financial firepower to effectively combat recession. But until then, from Alex and me and all of the team at the show, it's goodbye for now and we hope to see you next week. <laughs>